Good afternoon, eh, to all of you. Uh, several days ago, Brother Edmund asked me to speak to you all today. Lah. So he said, this is a youth group. So I heard youth group, I said, tak boleh lah. Different frequency lah, old man like me. He said, this group very mature. So I asked him, what's the age group? He said something like 18 to 24. Uh, it's mature enough. <laughs> so I thought for young people, what should I tell, what should I talk about? At first he suggested some dumb topic. I thought that would be a bit uh, dry. Lah. So uh, I remember a few years ago, uh, there was a doctor in Singapore was a plastic surgeon, I think, do this uh, Botox and all that, beautifying women. At first, he intended to be a specialist doctor, but then he thought, ah, it's a faster way to make money eh, by becoming this type of uh, plastic surgeon. So, he opened his clinic. It seems the f- first year, eh, he was already a millionaire. And later, eh, he got a few doctors under him, eh, six doctors or something like that. But at the age of 40-something, uh, he suddenly got cancer. And uh, he was dying of cancer. And then uh, he went to his old university, I think, in the U.S., and gave a talk to the students. Uh, they said, how oh, you are so ambitious. Uh, before, uh, all he wanted was to make a lot of money. And he be- had become so rich, uh, he bought... Ferrari, Porsche, and all these things. By the age of 40-something, he was dying. And then he regretted. He said, uh, money is all that. It's, it's not all that important. So I thought that kind of talk uh, benefits young people. Uh, young people, you are um, you're about to embark on your life. Uh, you've got to have a direction in life. Uh. So it's good to learn from the experience of others. So I thought I'll talk to you about my life. My life is in the opposite direction. I was born in Kuala Lumpur, 1947. I grew up in Kuala Lumpur. My parents were Penang Baba Nonia. I went to a Catholic school for 12 years. Never learned Mandarin. And because I was in a Catholic school for 12 years, I was very interested in the Catholic religion. So much so, I used to go to the chapel every day and pray. So, some Christian brothers, uh, they noticed. So, after school, they organized a special class for a few of us uh, who were very keen on the Catholic religion. But then, when they organized this special class for us, uh, many of us uh, had doubts. uh, and we will argue with them. And at my time, uh, those, uh, those brothers uh, were Irish, mainly. Uh, some French, some Canadian, all that. And they were very nice people. So nice uh, that probably today I'm a monk because I was inspired by them. And many of them died in Malaysia, never went back to their country. Uh, so it was a life of dedication uh, because of their religion. So, what were the doubts I had? They said, nah, you have to baptize, uh, otherwise you'll never go to heaven. So, we, we think, nah, if a person is not a Christian, nah, but he's a good man, and he helps people, does not do evil, doesn't sound logical nah, that he has to go to hell forever and ever, isn't it? In the first place, nah, why make hell? You make hell to put somebody there, isn't it? Don't have to make hell. Ma. Make everybody go to heaven, isn't it? Uh, it's a kind of questions uh, as a young man we ask. La. They could not give us a satisfactory answer. La. And then they say that God knows everything. God knows the past, the present and the future. And then we think if God knows everything, uh, when he makes somebody... Uh, he knows in the future this person will go to heaven or hell. 
if he sees this person is going to hell, I'll put on hold. I don't put on hold. He continue to make that person and then he goes to hell forever and ever. So all these doubts uh, made me leave the Catholic religion uh, because at one time I thought I was going to baptize or so. Uh, so after that, I went to the University of Malaya, studied engineering, 1967 until 1991. And then I graduated uh, and I worked in the public works department as an electrical engineer. Shortly after graduating, I saw my friends one by one getting married, usually pairing off with another university student. But somehow, I had the feeling uh, that was not the way I wanted to go. I had a feeling there was a motive in my life. I was looking for something. I didn't know what it was. So, in my last year in the university, I had a friend uh, who was very interested, a Chinese Malaysian, very interested in Hinduism. So he influenced me. Uh, I also got interested in Hinduism. So when I started work, after a few months from Kuala Lumpur, I was posted to Johor Bahru to look after the new section, uh, starting an electrical section in Johor State. So I used to write to India, write to America for these Hindu books, uh, Ramakrishna, Amat, Self-Realization Fellowship in California and all that. I started to learn meditation on my own. And I was very inspired uh, by some of these Hindu yogis. Uh, they were so sincere and they strove so hard. Uh, some of them had psychic powers. And some of them had this, this, uh, some of these qualities from the past, like, like Ramakrishna. Ramakrishna, as a small boy, you know, one day was walking the fields. I looked at the sky. The sky was so blue and so beautiful and so white. When he stared at the sky, his mind opened up like the sky. He came, he, he became, he, he entered that absorption state, now his whole body fell down. So in India, there are many sincere yogis who in the past life already cultivated many lifetimes. So, and then, after about three years in Johor, I was posted back to Kuala Lumpur, worked in the main public works department, workshop, and then after that, I was sent to the general hospital to take care of the engineering department for less than a year. Then I was promoted to Kuantan, in charge of the electrical and mechanical maintenance of a very large military base in Kuantan, about 10 kilometers from Kuantan town. Mm. Then uh, it was there that things started to happen for me. Uh, because uh, being in charge of the electrical and mechanical installations in that military camp, uh, those military people, uh, they often wanted the help of the public works department, so they were very nice to me. Uh, by the way, that was a senior engineer's post, so I was promoted uh, after four years of working uh, to a super scale post. Uh, many people work in the government service uh, all their life, has never get promoted to a super scale post. But my karma was so good after four years, I got promoted. And uh, that base was so big, uh, it has a, a air force under a colonel, there's a brigade under a general, it has a recce unit, three units. Recce unit was under a colonel. And, and so they invited me to stay in the army officers' mess. I stayed with the army officers, they gave me a room. And uh, I ate with the army officers in the army style. Always there's a bad man standing beside eat already and you put your fork and spoon together, they come and take your plate away and serve you coffee and all this. And then in the evening, we'll drink beer. So, mixing so much with these army officers, uh, it was days of 
wine, women, and song. So, after half a year, uh, living a bit of a wild life, uh, I started to have dreams about ghosts every night. Uh. Every night I dream of ghosts. I scarce myself why. Uh, every night I dream of ghosts. Uh. And I, when I started thinking, uh, I thought I must, when I was young, I was very into religion. Now I already left religion uh, for some time. Uh, so uh, I thought there must be a spiritual vacuum inside. So I started on a spiritual search. I went back to studying Hinduism, studied the Bible again, studied Sikhism, studied Baha'i religion, studied the Tao Te Ching, all the major religions of the world I studied. But when I wanted to find a Buddhist book, I could not find. Then one day, I went back to Kuala Lumpur for an engineer's meeting at the Public Works Department headquarters. Then I passed in PG, I passed uh, Taiwan. Then I looked at the Taiwan, there had a lot of trees. Unlike our Chinese temples, it's all concrete. But the Taiwan had a lot of trees, so I thought it was quite beautiful. So I drove inside. I walked up into the hall, the main shrine hall. I saw a big Buddha statue there. At that time, I was not a Buddhist. Lah. Mentally, I spoke to that big statue. I said, you are supposed to, a holy, to be a holy man. Why don't you show me your books? I've been looking for your books. I cannot find. Mm-hmm. Three days later, my nephew, uh, who comes from a very staunch Catholic family, brought me a Buddhist book. So after reading the book, uh, I found it was very logical. Uh, not like other religions. Other religions just ask you to believe. And so on. I don't ask too many questions. So, I went to the Sri Lankan temple where the book came from in Kuala Lumpur and got other books. And then even went to the University of Malaya. At that time, they still had Buddhist books. I went to take the Buddhist books and study. I found it very hard to understand, but I continued studying. Then the basic concepts... I slowly began to understand uh, like impermanence. Everything in the world is impermanent. And because of impermanence, everything must change. But there are certain things that give us happiness in the world. But that also has to leave us uh, because of change. Uh, there's a coming together, there's a parting. Uh. So, and also anatta, non-self, um, etc., that there are destinations of rebirth uh, that are painful, uh, woeful pains of rebirth, that you can be reborn, not only as a deva or devi, but also as a ghost, as an animal, and even go to hell. This is all very frightening. Uh. And then I started uh, studying. Uh, things started to happen for me. Conditions were right uh. One by one, I saw people dying in my office. Uh, I had a lot of Malay workers. One had cancer, and then he went for radiation. Over the months, I became thinner and thinner and thinner and died. Another one just bought a motor motorcycle. The next morning, he used the motorcycle to go to the mosque to pray. After praying, uh, he was going back to his house for breakfast uh, before coming to the office uh, on the main road. He got hit by a lorry uh, and dragged. So it was all scraped up. When I came to the office at 8 o'clock, I heard uh, that this man had died. And the, hosp- the, the cops were already in the mortuary in the general hospital. So I got a few office mates and we drove to the hospital, to the mortuary. You know, Muslims... Uh, Malays, uh, when they see their dead relative, they're not allowed to cry. You know? But when they brought the grandmother, the grandmother saw the grandson all scraped up like that, and she shouted so loud, chuchu, chuchu, and cried. So that was really something that uh, moved you. So there was a second one. Third one was uh, because that big military camp has a large... Uh, so a rage treatment plan asked the men to work on servicing the motors. So I was walking around looking and uh, I saw one worker went to a corner 
squatting in the corner. I thought I looked like he's not well, so I left him alone. After half an hour, I saw he was still squatting there. After 40 or 45 minutes, I still saw he was still squatting there. I went to ask him, what's wrong with you? He was clutching his heart. He said, suck it, Tuan, suck it. Cold sweat. So I knew he had a heart attack. I asked him, can you walk? He said, can. He said, you go into that room. I'm going to lie down. So he went to the room and lie down. I phoned the army captain, asked the army captain to come. Fifteen minutes later, he came, examined the man and he said, heart attack. He said, must call an ambulance. So he phoned for the ambulance. Took another half an hour for the ambulance to come. So this man had laid, laid down about 45 minutes. He was feeling better. Ambulance came, brought him to the general hospital 10 kilometers away. And then so happened the man inside the ambulance, uh, another Malay man, knows him. Uh, so they started to check. And because he was feeling better, I sat up to talk with this man. When you sit up, uh, your heart got to pump up and pump down. Uh, when he reached the hospital, another attack, uh, he died. So after he died, uh, he was staying in the government quarters. Uh, so we had to ask the family to leave. Uh, out of compassion, uh, we let the wife stay another three months. And after that, they have to leave. Uh, then the kampung people built a wooden house for the family. Uh, and she had to sell kueh, uh, sell dumplings and all that kueh uh, to, to survive. Uh, so it was another sad case. Uh, so that was the third one. Fourth one, uh, when they asked the men to change the runway bulbs, uh, runway lights, uh, because this uh, military camp has a runway. It was used by military planes as well as civilian planes, uh, even up to today, I think. <clears throat> so they were changing the bulbs on the runway, and I was walking up and down. And there was a big day coming up. Uh, so the jets, uh, at that time they were training. At that time they were using turbine jets. Uh, so the jets would come down, uh, come to the VIP stand, uh, then pass the VIP, as they come towards the VIP stand, uh, they come low and uh, they flip their wing uh, and then go vertically up. It's like salute. Uh. So they come, flip their wings and go up. Uh, so I was walking up and down, I was observing. Then one plane came down and they flipped its wings, uh, hit the ground and somersaulted and burst into flames. Uh. When I saw, I got a shock. I thought, is this real or imaginary? It looks like a TV show. <laughs> so we all stared. And then somebody shouted, it can explode any time. So we all lay on the ground and watched. And then the plane was burning. And you see, you have a very disturbed feeling. You know, somebody is burning inside there and needs your help. You want to go and help, but you dare not go because it can explode any time. Then after a while, the fire fire truck came uh, and put out the fire. Later, we learned there were two pilots inside there. As he somersaulted, uh, one was beheaded. Another one was burned to death. Uh. So this was the fourth one I saw. Over these years, uh, when I was in the, working in the Kwantan. The fifth one, uh, one day I was driving to Kuala Lumpur for an engineer's meeting around Mentakap there. The road was winding and going up the hill. I was trying to overtake a long trailer, a long lorry. Very difficult to overtake because the road was winding. I kept following very close, uh, looking for an opportunity to overtake him. Suddenly, around the bend, uh, I saw a motorcycle come from the other direction. And there happened to be a rock on the road. The motorcycle hit the rock, uh, fell in front of the lorry. The lorry hit him directly. I saw him fall down. I stopped the car. I ran towards him and thought I to help him. The concussion was so great, the helmet fell off. Not only that, I knocked him so hard. The top of his head here opened up like a tin can. I could see the brain, the white brain. And the white brain very quickly turned red. And then the blood started to flow out. And he was twitching, twitching the whole body, twitching like a dying rat like that. So I just stood there and did some chanting for him. I was so intent on chanting, I forgot about the lorry. The lorry man came down uh, and then walked towards me. Uh, then when he saw, he got a shock. He said, not his fault and all that. I said, I understand. 
Then he went off and he drove off. Then only I realized I forgot to take his number. Nah. <laughs> so he went off. Then I kept chanting. And that time, uh, East Coast, uh, no, very few cars, no other car came. So until this fellow died, then I went off to make a police report at the next town. And the police don't, didn't seem very excited. I think this must have happened maybe several times. They asked me to make a report. I made a report. And then I went off. They never asked me for, they asked me to, to see them again. So you see, these five deaths made me see the Buddha's teaching is so true. And life is so uncertain. You think you are old only, you can die. Huh? But for sure, you know, in the middle of the life and you are enjoying life, huh? suddenly you are called to go. So, so from there, huh, I got more and more into Buddhism. Huh? And then I started to form the intention to become a monk. Huh? After you learn the Dhamma, then you find uh, the best profession is to be a monk or a nun. <laughs> then I slowly dawned on me, uh, this was what I was looking for uh, when I was young. I thought I had a motive and objective. Uh, this was what I, I was looking for. A lot to do in my past life. Uh. So I thought, uh, if I want to become a monk, uh, uh, to start practicing. Uh, so I started to become a vegetarian uh, as a layman. Uh, so I started vegetarian practice. By that time, you know, uh, being ignorant uh, about the supplements and all that, uh, uh, when I go with my colleagues for lunch, uh, I just order cha kui tiao, uh, which is just kui tiao plus the tau ge, nothing else. So eating like that, uh, not enough nutrition, my hair started to fall. <laughs> I started to fall. My mother got very worried. <laughs> then, uh, mm, I thought, uh, if I, my parents are much older, that were much older than me, uh, if I want to become a monk, uh, I have to leave something for them. Uh. So I took a government loan uh, and bought a house. Uh. Government loan is normally repayable in fifteen years. Uh. Mm. Then one day, I told uh, I told my parents. Uh, I wanted, I had this intention to become a monk. My father got a shock. Lah. He said, people got no job, ah, no money, ah, bankrupt already. Ah, no other way you only think of becoming a monk. You got a good job. <laughs> you got a good job. You want to become a monk? His eyes turned red. You know? So I knew he couldn't understand. Ah, so I don't, never mentioned to him again. Ah. And I told my mother, my mother said, wait, ah, wait until I go. And then I thought her mother lived up to a hundred years old, you know. <laughs> I had to wait for her to go. Huh? Wow, at that time, huh, my heart also ling ling. <laughs> no more interest. <laughs> but then every six months, I remind her. Uh, so I wanted to go to America because I was, uh, at that time, there was one Mahayana monk, a Chinese monk uh, in America. Supposed to be very strict, la. and then his disciples all put out tan. Put out tan is they never lie down to sleep, you know. They sleep sitting up, la. So I started to practice sitting up la, as a layman. Very difficult, you know. <laughs> you try to sit, sleep, la. like that. La. After a while, you fall one side. And he said, I mean, after a while, you fall the other side. Sometimes you fall forward. <laughs> That's not so bad. Nah. The worst is you fall backwards. Nah. <laughs> when you fall backwards, then you wake up <laughs> like a like heart attack. Nah. <laughs> so this happened quite a number of times. Nah. So after that, now nah, I do? I go against the wall. Nah. I go sit. <laughs> and then I sit until I fall asleep. I knock my head. <laughs> then again, sideways, sideways. Then uh, what I do? I put two chairs. Nah. And one plank in between, and put my hands on the on the plank and sleep. But sleeping that way uh, is very uncomfortable because your stomach uh, is so cramped like that. The most uh, two hours uh, you get up already, so you don't really have a good sleep. 
So one day I was driving to work, you know, driving to work, 10 kilometers the road. On the road, I fell asleep, you know, fell asleep, and the car coming, the, and my, my car veered to the other side of the road, and the car coming from the other, opposite direction was horning, 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 and then I woke up. Then I saw the car quickly swerve to one side, nearly had an accident. Hmm. So, finally, uh, you'll be able to sleep when you're too tired. When you're too tired, I sit any position so you fall asleep. <laughs> but it takes a lot of determination. Uh. So, after five years in Kwantan, uh, I was posted back to PWD headquarters uh, in 1980. Just before that, my father passed away, la. so I saw more dukkha. Uh, then, at the end of 1982, uh, I thought uh, I was ready to become a monk, uh, because uh, that 15-year loan uh, I paid up in four and a half years. Uh, the people were very surprised, uh, the financial people. People want to take longer to repay the loan uh, instead of uh, of 15 years, I paid in four and a half years. So just before I wanted to resign, uh, I got another letter uh, of promotion. <laughs> Want to promote me again, you know. <laughs> so I thought this must be Satan's trick, uh, trying to stop me from becoming a monk. <laughs> so I went to see the big boss. Uh, I said, I don't want, uh, don't want the promotion. He, he, he was surprised. Uh, people fight for promotion. Uh, here I'm given a promotion and I don't want. So after that, I put in my paper uh, and uh, resigned. At the end of 1982, I went to America, stayed in this Mayana temple. That Mayana temple uh, is a very difficult place to stay. Uh. There was uh, two or three other people who, want, who went with me, uh, also intending to become a monk. After one month, they all left, except me. Why? Because uh, you start the day about three o'clock, you get up. And then uh, between three and seven, uh, you do one hour of chanting, one hour of meditation, one hour of Pai Cham, bowing repentance. You recite Namo, the, 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 the Buddha's name, uh, then you bow. And then he's come up again, and then he <laughs> so one hour. So after that, uh, about seven o'clock, uh, if you want to take a bath, at that time you take a bath. Uh, then, then taking a bath is another cultural shock because uh, we are used to taking a bath in the bathroom. You know, you go into America, uh, GI style, how uh, go no room, uh, all naked, uh, bed together. Very susar, uh, we're not used to it. <laughs> and then, uh, so, uh, 7 o'clock, uh, we start work uh, on empty stomach, you know. No breakfast, never mind, no coffee or so, no tea. Drink water only, then go and work. And very tough work, uh, because that monastery uh, is an uh, old mental asylum. Abandoned mental asylum, 273 acres, hardly 10, 10, 10 men, about 20 women. And men have to do all the hard work, carry the Buddha statue from Taiwan, uh, dig hole to plant, uh, plant trees, uh, plant apple, plant orange, plant bamboo shoot, and all this thing. Uh. So, a lot of hard work. Then by 10.30, uh, to go and ring the bell and do chanting. Then at 11 o'clock we eat, eat up to 12. After eating, uh, you want to take a rest, cannot, cannot go and lie down, let's go and work again. Mm. Go and brush your teeth. Uh. By 1 o'clock, let's go and work again. Again, do all this tough work uh, until about, about 5 o'clock. Uh. Then we come back and do chanting one hour again. Uh. Meditation a while and then buying repentance. And then about eight, eight o'clock, uh, listen to Dhamma talk. 
listen to Dharma talk, uh, all the men uh, were going like that, half asleep. <laughs> and then this, some of these Americans, uh, they are very cholo, uh, very, the words is very coarse, uh, they are very blunt. Uh. I, get, I, got, I used to get scolding every day. Uh. Small, small things. Uh. We Asians, uh, you want to tell somebody off or so paise. Uh. They know uh, straight away, and then uh, there's one British monk, uh, he was so sleepy, he was going like that. This American monk uh, took off his, his shoe, uh, the, the monk shoe, uh, knocked him on the head. <laughs> he, not used uh, to see how to say. Uh, And then uh, the master, uh, and I read his books, uh, he's like a holy man, but I went to stay with him, uh, very different man, every day shouting, ego very big, temper very big, a lot of shameful things to say, right? they're not say. So, because of his attitude, uh, he get senior monks to spy on the younger monks and all that. Uh. So it's very stressful. Uh. So stressful, uh. one of the Vietnamese uh, novice monks, there were three of us novice monks, the other two were Vietnamese. One of them uh, committed suicide, uh, hang himself. But all this you don't hear, they stay there, and you know. So at the end of it, I got disappointed, uh. I left. Uh. 